Well, last night's RT Investigations Unit programme highlighted some severe problems in the country's ambulance service. The number of emergency ambulances and staff shifts have been cut, the programme reported, and the length of time that it takes ambulances to get to people in life-threatening emergencies, which exceeds both national and international standards, is putting lives at risk. Well, Martin Dunn is the Director of the National Ambulance Service, and he joins me now. Martin, thank you for coming in to us this morning. We're going to first of all, though, take a look at a clip from last night's programme. A life-threatening call comes in from Wexford Town. Three, one, Delta Z, three, over. A woman has lost consciousness and has collapsed just minutes away from the hospital. Lady has collapsed. Uh, the same of chest pain, chest pain. But at the time of the call, Wexford Town has no ambulance. The only one available in the county is driving towards Gorey. It's this ambulance that's now dispatched to the Wexford call. Twenty-five minutes later, the ambulance arrives on the scene. It's 17 minutes later than the HICWA standard of eight minutes for life-threatening calls. OK, well, that's just one clip from last night's uh, programme. Martin, I'd have to ask you, what's your reaction to that? 25 minutes for an ambulance to arrive in Wexford town. I mean, it's not in the middle of nowhere for a woman with chest pains. Well, I suppose the first thing to say, Keelan, is my reaction is that to anyone in the National Ambulance Service that deals with patients, and the patients are what we deal with all the time and at the forefront of everything we do, any delay is, is unacceptable. Uh, we deal with approximately 600 emergency calls a day, which is approximately 27,000 calls in a month. Uh, and we do our best to make sure that we get through as many of those calls as we possibly can in the times that we're expected to get there. I mean, what we're putting in place is huge change and huge reform. And the service is going through a stage of reform, which is patient, focused again on delivering excellent care to the patient in a timely fashion. So, so, I mean, are you in effect saying, listen, we do our best and the odd time is going to take 25 minutes to get to a woman in chest pains, nothing we can do about it? Well, at, uh, we're, we're always going to do more than our best for a patient. That's the first thing. Well, is the that good enough, Martin, though, 25 No, and, and what I'm saying is we're working extremely hard on that. The reform mechanisms that we're starting to put in place, and don't forget, we're only starting to measure these for the last two years. Other jurisdictions that were referred to in the course of the programme last night have been at it for nearly 20 years. We've only started in the last two years to start to put this in place. So what's so the point that it, only in the last two years have you started to, to try to be good enough? No. So therefore you can't be held to account for not arriving at time, on time at calls? No, absolutely not. What I'm saying is in the last two years we've been now tasked to get to those calls in them particular time frames. And what we have to do is reconfigure everything we're doing, which we are doing, look at how we're going to deliver it, take the patient into account and start building the best practice model around that to make sure we can meet that's kind of them. extraordinary to hear that it's only in the la you're talking about only in the last two years, you're talking about figures and structures. I would have thought the ambulance service always had the aim of getting to people in a timely fashion to get them to hospital. Always had, and I said I'm 27 years in the ambulance service myself and I'm very proud of the service we run and I'm very proud of the staff we do because for the 27 years I've been in it, everything is about the patient. Everything we do, everything we train for and everything we respond to. And we have been responding in, in a timely fashion for 27 years to the patients. I, I, absolutely, so I think people know that many ambulance people do, do fantastic work. We've all seen it, but we're not talking about that good work. We're talking about the problems in the system. Last night we saw one man on tape who had given his father CPR for 17 minutes waiting for an ambulance to arrive. His father died. Yeah. What's your reaction to that? Again, listen, my reaction to that is that all I, all I can say to them people is that we sympathise and we apologise for the delay that was but incurred. Does it not but indicate some structural problems within your service? Is well, it a good enough if a service can do that? Again, is what I'm saying to you, we're starting to work through this. We're changing the way we do it. You have to look at what the ambulance service was doing over the last number of years. And up to two years ago, the, the emergency ambulance, as we call it, was doing everything all levels of work across the country for everything, taking patients from hospitals to homes or taking patients from hospital to hospital. We've now put a new tier in that, which has now taken that people who need to go from hospital to hospital are brought by an intermediate care ambulance. So that's now allowing the emergency ambulance to start responding to emergency calls in a much more timely fashion. So are you saying we that are, what we saw last night, it's all different now? No, no, it's not. You're, you're Absolutely working on it. Not. We are working and we're working very hard with both the staff, okay, the unions I, and indeed the patients. We can are I ask you, Martin, hard. another issue that I found really striking last night was an image of a car park where there was some kind of conference going on and the car park was filled with these vehicles, their ambulance service vehicles. 
that according to last night's programme, and they have good evidence, they had tracked these cars over Christmas time in particular, these vehicles are more or less private cars for managers in the ambulance service. What was your reaction to that? Were you surprised? Were you shocked? Or were you, well, yeah, that's the way it is? No, and, and, and nothing to do with what we do is, is yes, the way it is. I, mean, I was, I was some, of the, some of the footage last night, definitely, uh, we will be reviewing it and we'll be looking at it in relation to how we do our job. And um, The cars that you're talking about are fully equipped ambulance service response vehicles. The people who drive them are paramedics. They drive them, they drive them and they respond to calls while they're at work, while they're going from but, and to from and to but, and from I mean, work. What's your reaction when you see those shots there? Is that, is that in any way acceptable, a car park full of these very expensive, very highly equipped vehicles? Again, the car park was there because there was a particular issue going on that we were dealing with and but it's part of the they, progression. Why weren't those vehicles being manned? Why weren't they available for, as you say, you'd put patients first? Surely they need the vehicles a lot more than the managers going to a conference. Absolutely. And I mean, what, there is vehicles available out there. There is other types of response vehicles that we have called RRVs. They are ORVs, right? But all the vehicles are fully crewed, fully kitted at all times. Then managers are fully trained paramedics and they respond to calls when and asked and requested to by control. And they do Even that. when they're at a conference Oh, absolutely. Up. absolutely. So you're saying that's not a problem, that the country's fleet is sitting out. No, that, and that's not the country's fleet. That's just a snapshot of okay. Okay, well, why did we hear last night from uh, people who work in the service saying that these vehicles are not available to them? when they have a call at night that they say that these vehicles are not available to okay. them. They're parked I, that, up at people's houses. We, that, you saw that woman last night yeah. saying that. I, said, I, we, I, talked, I heard that being said last night and as I said to you, some of this, the commentary that came out last night was quite interesting and we're going to be reviewing that because then vehicles are available and can be made available well, and will be made available. those vehicles should be available, it seems to be what you're saying because yeah, the they, evidence last night was that they're not. Well, I mean, again, I, what I'm going to have to do is going to have to review that and I'm delighted that our staff actually retired and operating staff to come on last night to make those points because that shows, by the way, that as far as we're concerned, the dedication of our staff to get ambulances Yeah, and nobody's got the dedication, Martin, so, I don't think. It's, absolutely. it's the system. And we, we, are, we are working to improve that system. We have introduced, as I said, intermediate care vehicles. We now actually have the use of one direct helicopter, okay. as you know. We've actually four others backed up from the Coast Guard. We've improved our fleet hugely. We've improved our staff hugely. And what we're going to do is get improve the service to meet those targets and make sure okay. the patients of this country are looked after properly. All right, listen, Martin, thank you very much indeed for coming in to us okay. this morning. Thank, thank you. you very